contributed to professional wrestling as a wrestler, commentator, promoter, publisher, trainer, podcaster, and all-around raconteur, will receive the inaugural award. Thatcher began his career in 1960, wrestling for Tony Santos. This began an association with professional wrestling that continues to this very day. Thatcher has served the wrestling profession in every manner imaginable and is proud of the 60 plus year association with our sport. Mr. Thatcher, please come up to accept your award. cities it took to raise Les Thatcher six, over 63 years in this wrestling business, but a hell of a lot of them are here tonight. And you know what? They're all my brothers. Because we have a bond that you can't find anywhere else. You just can't. And, and part of this award thing with me is so personal because the Jack Briscoe Award 
the name on that is one of the best friends I've ever had and one of the best wrestlers I've ever known. Better than his little brother, of course. <laughs> the, the only salvation for me tonight is that Gerald was not introducing me. We'll get out of here before 2 a.m. and he'll leave me a minute, minute and a half to talk. Right? But, you know, we were business partners. The first wrestling t-shirts came Thatcher, Briscoe, and Briscoe. And it all started, Gerald's apartment in Charlotte, and we're sitting around sharing beer and just talking about life in general. And so I was kind of sharing some frustrations because I thought, it's time for wrestlers to have t-shirts. This was in 1972. And I had mentioned it to a couple promoters and they, they didn't say it was a bad idea, they just weren't interested. So I threw that out to Jack and Jerry. And I wish I could imitate that damn Jack's deep voice. I've got a deep voice, but I could, well, hey, Les, why don't we do it? Uh, yeah, the three of us. Well, I'll kick in. Well, we did. And the first professional wrestling t-shirts were Thatcher, Briscoe, and Briscoe, the Briscoe Booster t-shirt. And nobody thought, what is going to do? The first night we had them, Gerald and I took them to Fayetteville, North Carolina. I think we invented the gimmick table, because before you just had eight by 10 pictures to sell, you carry around in your hand. We got all these t-shirts and we did a table to put them on. And you know the old thing about the product went flying off the shelves? They were lined up five and six deep to get these t-shirts and man, have we hit it. So it was going real good. We, we were doing well, but we were not entrepreneurs. We were not Conrad Thompson, were we? Not at all. <laughs> But, <clears throat> excuse me, but we didn't have a big profit part. You could go out with these t-shirts for $3.50. Try that today, right? Yeah. But, <laughs> but of course then, so buildings wanted some of the money. And once promoters, believe this or not, I know you probably think I'm lying, saw us making money, now they wanted a piece of that action that they didn't want before. So finally, we got out of the t-shirt business, but we got something started, I think. I'm not real sure. I've teased Jerry a couple times. If we could just get 1% of the net every month on wrestling t-shirts, I don't know where we'd build the castle, but we damn sure would build it someplace. You know? <laughs> but I love those guys. They are my family. They'll always be my family. I need to thank so many people. You know, in terms of in-ring, I don't know how many guys I've wrestled. I don't know how many matches I've had. I really don't. But I know this. I owe a vote of thanks to every man I was ever in the ring with, whether I put him over or he put me over, because it was a part of my education. Uh, Tony Santos broke into business, the first wrestling school ever. I got on a Greyhound bus in Cincinnati in February 1960, 19 year old kid, and I went to Boston, Massachusetts to learn to be a professional wrestler. My mother and father, Sam and Dorothy Milady, I won the parent lottery, I truly did. They were supportive of everything their goofy kid tried to do drag racing, baseball, basketball. But when their friends were saying, my son's gonna be a mechanic, my son's going to the army, my son's gonna be a lawyer, their son's going off to Boston to learn to be a wrestler? What's up with that, right? So, but they were supportive. And God bless them, if it weren't for them, there wouldn't be a me to begin with. But all those guys that I was in the ring with, win, lose, or draw, I owe them. I owe my parents. And Tony Santos, who broke me into business, it cost me an absorbent $300 for six months training. <laughs> and I started in February. My first match it was July the 4th, 1960. And I celebrated the 63rd anniversary of that this past 4th of July. So. <laughs> I owe so many people go to thanks. Jim Barnett gave me the name Thatcher because he got tired of people mispronouncing Melody as Melody, Melody, Melody. Lastly, <laughs> we need to give you a new name. And he came up, how did he come up with Thatcher? I don't know, it's too late to ask him now. But I was a 21 year old kid, I just want to wrestle. Call me whatever you want, I don't care. Just let me get the ring and do this thing. I have been blessed to walk among the giants of this industry. Whether they be wrestlers, broadcasters, bookers, or promoters. I have worked with the best of the best. And if you can't learn a little something and be half-assed good at it, then, you, then you've lost completely. Bookers, Leo Garibaldi, Eddie Graham, George Scott. My God. If that's not a Mount Rushmore, 
I don't know what is. And when it comes to broadcast, I've worked with the Mount Rushmore. I've, you may have your, yours, but I've got mine. When you sat and shared a microphone with Gordon Soley, Jim Ross, Bob Cottle, Lance Russell, again, if you can't learn anything, you're in trouble, brother. You know, people ask, how, how is it to work with JR? How is it to work with Cottle? Those guys are great. They were. They're pros. I'll give you a funny example of that. First time Jim, JR, and I ever sat down on the mic together was the Night of Legends of Smoking Out Wrestling. And we had met before, but we never worked together. So halfway through the show, it was intermission. We went to the back, get a drink, and rap, relax a little bit. Terry Funk came up to me. Terry Funk was in this concert conversation a lot that I did. And he said, Les, he said, I've been watching the show on the monitor. The way you and JR call it wrestling is the way it should be called. How long have you been working together? I said, wait a minute. About an hour and a half. And I won't say, use the language Terry said, oh, oh yes. you know, I said, no. But that's how easy it was to work with those guys. And I, you know, to me, it was, you get an offer to try something. Rudy Kay is the man who put me behind a microphone the first time. We had been tag team partners off and on in the Carolinas in the 60s with we your neighbors. He opened his territory to Eastern Canada, and I went up there to wrestle in 1970. He called me one day and said, my commentator at death in his family in Toronto, he's got to go take care of his family. We need somebody to fill in. You used to talk about, you like, after watching or learning uh, how Gordon worked and having become friends with him, you'd like to try to <coughs> broadcast. Well, guess what? <laughs> Wednesday morning at Halifax, you are handling a microphone. I had never queued in or out of a segment. I had never read a run sheet. And there were no broadcast teams in. You had put the microphone in my hand, and brother, you're stuck with it. And that was, that was how it started for me. After a couple weeks, and I thought, I'd, you know, that would be it. Rudy said, hey, you're doing a good job. I'm going to leave the guy in Toronto. We'll work out a deal and just finish out the season. So that's how I got started. Rudy did it for me. Came back to the stage, went back to wrestling. I thought, okay, that's cool. You know, I've had a good time. Mr. Crockett's office about a year and a half later, Lord Littlebrook was in there. He said, Mr. Crockett, why isn't Les on your TV? Oh, what do you mean, bro? He is on my TV. Wrestling. No, no, no. He did Rudy's TV last summer in the Maritimes to have a job. Mr. Crockett, he said, you never told me. I said, Thought it was important. You want to try it? Let's do it. So those are the people that opened that door for me. In 1974, Ron Fuller called me and said, I bought the Knoxville Territory where I had been the top babyface along with Whitey Caldwell as a babyface tag team for a long time. He said, I know nothing about television. He won't tell you that now, though. <laughs> and I need you to call what you come in and build me a television show. You have Cara Blanche within reason. We knew each other. And so we began with show that a lot of the old timers said, you can't do this. You can't put a pre-taped, sit down interview in the middle of a show, you kill the heat. But I knew you had more to sell than bumps and heat. NASCAR sold personalities. You loved the driver because he drove the kind of car you did. So we started personality profiles giving the guys backgrounds, inside information, you know, hobbies and stuff. And I'll tell you a funny story about that. A lot of old timers thought I wouldn't get over. One night in the Knoxville Coliseum, a lady comes up here, Les Thatcher, yes ma'am. Well, I'm uh, secretary to Professor so-and-so, who's head of this, the history department in the University of Tennessee. And he heard you and Bob Armstrong talking about uh, doo-wop rock and roll music in the 50s. Was that part of the show, or do you both? No, we're both big fans. Well, the professor would like you to answer some questions or a test. And she handed me two self-addressed envelopes. Both had two typewritten she sheets of paper with questions about doo wop music. So I think our personality profile kind of got over and did the job. You, you can sell tickets with more than just wrestling. You can sell it with that guy's personality. You get, a, you get a bigger feel for a, uh, being a fan for somebody if you've shared something with that person. Went to the same college, drive the same kind of car, have the same hobby. So somebody's always made me 
put me in a position to try something. But I want to say this, in all the things that I've done, magazines, training, television, I've never done anything or wanted to do anything to try to change what was going on between bell to bell. All I wanted to do was enhance the things around it to make it more palatable and to give it more depth. And the other thing is, I will determined never in my life to do anything to, rather than to give respect to this industry and the people in it. And for that is one of the reasons I'm proud to get this award because that's the way I feel about the business. Now we talk about tough guys and I've got some new friends too, or not completely new. My buddy JBL, I was on their podcast a while back. This guy gave me the greatest intro I've ever had in my life. And I'm thinking, how, how do I answer this, right? When, he, when I finally get to talk, what do I say? He said, he's done this and he's done that. And now let me tell you who's here today, Les Thornton. <laughs> I mean, I love Les Thornton. He's a good guy, but I'm not him. <laughs> Way to go, John. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> James Beard. Everybody knows James as a referee in Dallas. And uh, you know what? This weekend is only the second time in our lives that we have been where we could sit down and spend time and talk together. But over the years, we have had our phone conversations rebuilding the business, <laughs> picking it apart, telling what we would do, what we should do. And when we first met in Vicksburg, this is what, three years ago? It was like we'd known each other all our lives. That's the other great thing about this business. I haven't seen Bruce Pritchard in how long, run around with his goofy brother in Knoxville. <laughs> but we just, like we saw each other yesterday. And that big sucker back there, Bill DeMont, right? <laughs> Tough guy. But you know, he came as part of the WB development to help me with uh, the kids. And here's the thing, I trained developmental guys during the day. The guys that were paying to be at HWA were there in the evenings. Now, when he was done, he was to go watch television, go to the bar, go to sleep, go to get sun. Bill, come back in the evening. He didn't have to, he wasn't getting paid to do it, to work with those kids, to help them improve. And for that, I love Bill DeMont. And that character, Haku, you think he's tough? Yeah, well, I know another, he's looking at I may get my ass handed to me tonight. I don't know for sure, but what the hell? After the award, what's left? Right? That's the top of the mountain. This guy came down and worked with the kids in HWA for a couple months. The last week he was there, we had a Tuesday night in-house show. Maybe 110 people in the gym, right? Tuesday night showcase. So Haku comes in, Les, like to work with Time Bomb. I had a little kid that I had trained, 5'6", 200 pounds. He was never going any place, but everybody that was around the boys from up Connecticut, every, his work ethic was second to nobody's. And they all appreciated and loved the kid, right? So Haku says, I want to work with Time Bomb. I said, sure. If he had said, I'm going to beat him six, 60 seconds, I said, sure. You know, you outweigh by 150 pounds, and you are who you are. I never told the guys from the main roster what to do with the kids, just teach them. So I went out to watch the match. Haku starts time bomb, picking away at one leg, taking, his taking the big guy's balance away from him, taking the big guy's balance away from him. So Haku's staggering and fine. Now, now I'm picking up the conversation from time bomb's perspective. When I talk to him, he said, he's selling my leg, he's selling his leg. And, less. and he said, slam me. And I said, what? He said, slam me. That big sucker went up like a feather. Time bomb posed him here and down. And when he did, 
110 people blew their minds. He got that little boy over in one move. And made. I, I said to the kid, you know how respected you are. That's why I love that big SOB. I've known, I've known Boogie since he had no beard. About 100 pounds more was a handsome young man. I told him this story and I've never told anybody else. Uh, he had sent pictures. This was the big Jimmy Valley, this handsome stud, right? To Nick Goulas. You'd realize he didn't know much about business at that time, right? <laughs> So Nick comes into the dressing room in Nashville one night. Myself, Ken Lucas, Dennis Hall, Len Rossi. He always went to Len for feedback. Len, look at this kid's picture. Handsome devil, look at the muscles. Yeah. He wants to come in. We'll bring him in. We'll do him with this and this. Put a belt on him, do this and this. And then Len said, wait a minute, Nick. Can he work? He said, hell, Len, I don't know. They brought him in. I took him to Knoxville the first out of the bat. There was no hotel room for him, so I had to share the room. And like he told my wife the other night, I got your husband in trouble, and he damn sure did. He made me stop sharing hotel rooms with wrestlers for the rest of my life. <laughs> but I love him too. This has been, yeah, I guess, listen, you start me to, my wife will tell you, you start talking, me talking about wrestling, I may, Rock, I think I can break your record. Where the hell are you? <laughs> but you know, again, I can't tell you how honored, privileged, and humbled I am to be here because it's taken me 63 years. And I wouldn't, well, I won't say I wouldn't change a thing. Hell, I probably got a list of 100 things I might like to change, right? <laughs> Looking back. But again, this is who I am, it's what I do. And I don't, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm winging it. I've been winging it for 63 years. Why the hell try to put notes together tonight, right? But for all, I, I tell the story about the concert, but I, I don't want to make it. <laughs> Gerald knows how to draw a crowd, right? Hey, I can go lay around the hospital for a couple of days, chase the nurses, <laughs> and get a lot of sympathy, right? He knows how to work as a baby face, right? No more Gable gear for you, kid. Anyway, I. I'm trying not to take any more of your time, but I want to thank the industry, the hall. I am so proud to be here. I am so honored. And if this is the end of the line, I'm good with that. But I don't want it to be. I'm healthy, and I'm still ready to do whatever you got for me in the business. Let's make some more history. God bless you all. Thank you so much. Presented to a wrestler who used their skills in the